So we're here to talk about the courage and compassion to do the right thing. That's what you'll learn about in the talk today by Marty Brownstein, author of the book Two Among the Righteous Few, A Story of Courage in the Holocaust. Since 1991, Marty has led the consulting firm The Practical Solutions Group, serving a wide variety of clients across many industries on issues of leadership and organizational effectiveness. Through this work, he has written seven books from contributing author to solo author, including Communicating Effectively for Dummies, Coaching and Mentoring for Dummies, and Managing Teams for Dummies. This is good. <laughs> <laughs> His eighth book that you are about to hear about is quite different and special. It takes Marty back to his early career as an educator when he was teaching history, including the Holocaust. This true and remarkable story has a meaningful and personal collect connection as well, which he will explain today. Um, he has brought books with him um, to sell and to sign for anyone who is interested in purchasing the book. He's be uh, for $13. And uh, please give a warm welcome. Marty. OK, thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you, Chase. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Let me try that again. Good afternoon, everyone. Get ready because I'm going to take you on a journey into a remarkable story. And to start this journey, I want you to be thinking about three questions. So question number one, would you be willing to help others whose lives are in great danger? So think about that for a moment. Not an easy question. Question two, would you be willing to help others whose lives are in great danger, knowing if you get involved to help, you probably put your life in great danger. Would you still help? And question three. Would you be willing to help others whose lives are in great danger, knowing if you get involved, you probably put your life in great danger, when these people who most need the help, most everybody else wants to hate them or be indifferent to their plight? Would you still get involved and help? Two Among the Righteous Few, a story of courage in the Holocaust, is a true story of a Catholic couple that answered a definite yes to all three of those questions in a time period when most everybody else said no. They are true heroes. And I always say to give this book its just due, I should say its title is this. That's the title of this book translated into Dutch. For the story takes place in the Netherlands during World War II and the Holocaust. And this couple is a young married couple named Franz and Mien Weinacher. Franz and Mien Weinacher. And here is a picture of them at this time period. Just a young married couple, ordinary people, who will end up doing extraordinary things. And in a moment, I'm going to take you into the story, and we're going to start by first looking at the greater historical context in which it takes place, World War II in Europe, the Holocaust, and life in the Netherlands during the Nazi occupation through the war, the worst of all of Western Europe. When you see that picture that I'll paint, when I then talk about who they were and what they end up doing, you're going to see how remarkable and unusual it was. The last thing I will cover then is, as Chase said in the introduction, I have a very meaningful personal connection to this story, and one I understand so much more today than I would have a few years more before I got into all this. But I say that for last, and then we'll have a few minutes for your questions will be most welcome here. We're going to pause before I get into this. This is a story I stumbled into by accident. It's now four and a half plus years ago that I did that. And if you would have told me over four and a half years ago that one day you're going to write a story and a book about this couple named Franz, I mean Weinacher, I said, who are they and why would I do that? As you heard, it's very different than what my work has been. Maybe I'd heard the name before, but it never stuck. And here's the part I wouldn't believe at all. Not only will you end up writing the book and be lucky enough to find a publisher for it, but when it comes out, you're going to go on this unexpected journey with it. And you're going to be speaking in a variety of places, churches, synagogues, universities, schools, people's homes, bookstores, libraries, etc. I've left out many. And it's going to become so much a part of your life. In fact, you're going to have people, and hopefully some of them are in this room today, who will become supporters for you helping you get other opportunities or just supporting the efforts like some of them right up here. I got people right up here. Thank you, units, for coming today. Thank you, others who are being here who basically say, I'll help support, get the word out, come see you. Those things have made a difference. In fact, today, as I've just begun year three of this journey, this is event number 185. So I want to let's stop for a moment and thank Chase here with the university for making this happen. <laughs> Much appreciated. Thank you. Now, let me take you into the story. And we're going to start with the historical context and what it takes place and we'll see what you know about your history. 
Got maybe some professors of history, although we won't put them on the spot. And by the way, if you guess right, see Chase surprises afterwards. <laughs> and if you guess wrong, it's okay. We don't throw anything at you. So here's the first question. I said the story takes place during World War II in Europe. So when does World War II in Europe begin and where? After the war in 39 in Poland. Very good. September 39, it begins in Poland. When what happens there? An attack by whom? German. Yeah, German. And who's leading Germany at this point? Hitler. All right, you know that well. So Adolf Hitler, the German forces invade Poland September 1st of 1939. Britain and France, the other powers of Europe, declare war because of that. World War II begins. And this war is not going to be short. It'll have a little break after Poland falls within 30 days and Britain and France give them no help. And it'll actually be quiet for a few months. They'll even in the headlines call it the phony war. It must not really be going on. But it will erupt. And it will spread all over. And finally end in Europe when? Yes, and when in 45? Close. Someone said May up here. Yes, May 45, it will finally end in Europe. August 45, it ends when Japan and Asia surrenders. This war, still true today, is the most destructive war in humankind's history by far. When it's finally over, you're going to have billions of dollars of property damage worldwide, and over 50 million people are going to die in this awful war. And one of the things that we saw in this war we had never quite seen in wars before because certainly we'd seen death and destruction. Over half of that 50 million, the greater number, will be civilians. And the soldier casualty rate is extremely high. So in many of the places where this war is going on, and you're the average citizen just trying to live and survive, good luck, you may be caught into this. And in fact, nearly two-thirds of the death and destruction through this awful war will take place in the continent of Europe. There will not be a single country, 30 plus that are there, that will not be adversely impacted by this awful war during this time period. You don't want to be in Europe at this time period. It is an actual nightmare to try to live and survive. Franz and Weinacker, that's where they live. Good luck. Now, my next question is we look at the greater historical picture of the story. Let's go to the Holocaust, the event, capital H. When does that begin and where? Good question. All right. Make some guesses. I think a lot of you probably know. Don't hurt. Where does it begin? What country? Poland, not yet. But it will get there, and it'll be probably the worst spot of all the period. But it doesn't start there. Germany. It starts in Germany. Very good. And when? Ah, uh, Kristallnacht was a major, awful event, November 38. And at that point in time, it's already been going on for a few years. So we've got a good guess on the table, 38, but it was before then. Keep going, keep going. 1933 is when it begins when Hitler came into power. Very good. That's it. Because that political change that takes place in Germany, which, by the way, he comes through the democratic process. Yeah, prizes later, yes. As he comes through the democratic process, a short time after becoming chancellor, appointed chancellor, he will throw democracy out the window, dictatorship takes over, and the persecution that becomes the part of the Holocaust begins right away. But the Holocaust won't just stay in Germany. You mentioned Poland. And actually, it's going to end up spreading throughout all of Europe and even into North Africa before it's finally over, which is when? When does it finally end? Say again. Yes. 45? Very good. May of 45, when the war in Europe ends. Two separate events, by the way. But they'll end up running simultaneously over a period of time. And the Holocaust will go in three phases and will get worse in each one to the final phase of the mass murder. When it's finally over, this nation-sponsored, systematic, and racist effort to persecute, isolate, and then mass murder millions of people on Adolf Hitler's list of so-called inferiors or undesirables, when it's finally over, over 11 million people will be murdered in the Holocaust. In addition, what's happening in the war? It's an awful time period. Out of that 11 million plus, Jews were the number one target. There are going to be 6 million out of that. Were the 11 million part of the 50 million? In addition to. In addition to. So you've got the war going on, you've got the Holocaust going on. In essence, two wars at once. But this one had innocent victims and civilians primarily. In fact, let's see, uh, even go to among the other five million plus victims, beyond Jews, who were the number one target, who were some of them? Homosexuals. Very good. Gypsies. Homosexuals, gypsies, keep going. 
Political dissidents and opponents. Big one for Hitler. And for Hitler, it was all, he never saw religion. It was race or politics. So if you were the communist, you were a dissident, you're going to speak out, you become a victim. Jehovah Witnesses, not because of religion, because they didn't go along in Germany. And it's a whole list of, by the way, Slavic heritage people, which takes in a lot of different countries throughout Central, Southern, Eastern Europe. Many of them, Poles were the largest group out of that. Non-Jewish Poles, I'm talking. Whole big list. And if you're on your list, not on this list, not as your life a nightmare, it's even worse, it's doomed. And in many cases, it's too late before you could even figure it out. But in this period of time, if you could figure out what's going on, because in the 1930s, as it's starting, in Germany, then Austria, then Czechoslovakia, even before the war begins, a refugee crisis is breaking out throughout Europe, out of these countries, that'll only get worse when the war begins. If you sought the help of any governments during this time period, United States, Britain, Canada, for example, among others, how many were willing to help this massive refugee crisis? Say that out loud, please. Nobody. That's right. There will only be a handful of people throughout the whole continent of Europe that'll have the courage and compassion to get involved and try to help. Franz and Mean Weinacher here are part of that few. It's a climate of hate and indifference. And in fact, by the time the United States enters World War II, which is when? Yes, and when in 41? That's right. So it's late 41 when the United States will finally enter this war because of the attack on Pearl Harbor. Japan is allied with Germany and Italy in the Axis, and they'll declare war against the United States. By the time we, they've come into the war, let's take you back in Europe, life is so bad in Europe at this point. By the way, who's winning the war? Germany and its allies, but Germany's the primary force, have pretty much conquered most of Europe. In fact, there's only in Europe, how many countries left still trying to fight them? How many? Very good. And you know which ones? Got the right number. France, mighty powerful France, rolled in a month. They've already surrendered. And Britain and Russia. Britain and, and then it was called the Soviet Union, Russia being a subset of it. That's it. And neither one of those are doing well. The grip of Europe is in Nazi Germany's hands. And what's it mean for the Holocaust by late 41? The final phase of the Holocaust, known as the final solution, is now off and rolling. In Eastern Europe already, a million and a half people have been killed through murder squads in the death camps by the start of 1942. Six major death camps in Poland are up and operating. There's life in Europe who wants to be there. That's where they live. And I'm going to take you inside their country, the Netherlands. When the war breaks out in September of 39, the Dutch government said, we're going to be neutral. And they were neutral during World War I and hoped to be left out of it in World War II. That will not be their choice. Netherlands is not a big country. Densely populated, though. There's this big country on their eastern border called Germany. They made the decisions of who they're going to leave neutral and who they're not. May 1940, German forces come attacking over the Dutch eastern border. The Dutch, knowing that the neutrality likely would not be honored, put up a fight initially, which the Germans don't like. Mighty Holland, or small Holland, against mighty Germany, with no help from Britain and France. France ruled in less than a month. Holland will surrender in less than a week. By the way, as we've done these talks in many places, we met some people who were children in the Netherlands at that time. And I've turned that into a former question. How long did Holland last before they surrendered? They go, five days. They remember it like it was yesterday. The scars run deep. And after they surrender, Nazi Germany will take over, put their own man in charge to run the country. And he'll surround himself with his own henchmen. And this occupation of the Netherlands will last five miserable years. Until the war ends in May of 45 is not until Holland is fully liberated. And here is what life will be like under this miserable occupation. And you can summarize it in two words, repressive and brutal. For instance, freedom of the press, gone, replaced with censorship and propaganda. In fact, one of the early resistance efforts by the Dutch, underground newspapers. In fact, before the war is over, because they don't want you to hear anything from the outside world, they want to keep you ignorant and compliant, they're going to even order Dutch citizens to turn in their radios. Interesting thing about Franz Weinacher, he never did follow that order. He hid his radio. And that was something different about him than the average person. He did not mindlessly follow rules all the time. In addition to this brutal and repressive life, strict rationing, good to, hard to get the food you need. You've got to use those ration cards. And the idea if you want to protest, go on strike against this, speak out negatively against this German occupation, here's the repercussions. Arrest, torture, beating, sometimes execution. And as time goes on, one of the scariest things that will happen to the Dutch, the term for it was forced labor, meaning this. You got this notice that said, go work in Germany. 
in the factories and fields to support the German war effort. By the way, the Germans never had enough of their own labor for that. Where were their able-bodied young men and some of the young women? That's right. And actually two wars, you could say today. The military one, which we call World War II, took a lot of soldiers. This thing we call the Holocaust today took a lot of labor to run all those concentration camps. So they don't have enough labor. So they take from the occupied country and say, go work in Germany. During the course of the war, 350,000 Dutch citizens went into forced labor working in Germany. 30,000 don't come home alive when this is over. Some come home disabled. You don't want that job assignment. Franz Weinacher, by the way, got notice that he's supposed to go get medically checked out to report for forced labor. If he leaves, things that I'm going to talk about sh shortly are going to be doomed. Major challenge he has to overcome. And here was one of the most scary things. In time, because the Dutch weren't ready when they got conquered to resist, in times as resistance groups get organized and form, and they start going into more dangerous forms of resistance, espionage, hit and run attacks, they're often getting caught, arrested, executed, or they better go into hiding. And this is if you hit key people, the Dutch collaborator collaborators, or in the German Nazis in particular, look out for the reprisals. For example, February 1943, one of the high-ranking Nazi officials in the country was stationed in the capital city of The Hague. And one night, February 1943, his doorbell rings, he opens it up, two Dutch resistance fighters targeting him shot him dead. When the head of the SS operations in the Netherlands, the security arm of the Nazi machine, when he got wind of this, he ordered 50 people rounded up and executed and made sure the public knew this. And this will be a reign of terror that is commonplace in the Netherlands throughout all of 43, 44, until the war ends in 45. There's life in the Netherlands who wants to be there. That's where they live. Well, the last and major priority of the Germans in running this country was this. Persecute, isolate. Round up those who don't live in the major city of Amsterdam and put them into Amsterdam into ghettos, and then deport them to the train, on the trains to the death camps in Poland, the entire Jewish population they could get their hands on. And the Jewish population in the Netherlands was approximately 1.5% of the total prior to the occupation. If you're on that list, because they're going after you, good luck. If you could figure it out in time, your best hope, go into hiding. But will anybody help? Contrary to popular belief, most Dutch are not going to get involved to help in one way or another. Indifference, fear, and just trying to survive this awful war is pretty much the priority for most people in the Netherlands. And I hope I don't get pulled off into forced labor. Don't bother me with your plight, sorry. And when I talk about fear, now there are some that felt sympathetic to what was happening to their, the persecution they could see happening over time against Jews. But if you rang the doorbell and said, please help, they would not open their door. Why not? And what are they afraid of? And if you get caught trying to help hide a Jew, let alone others, but especially a Jew, what will happen to you? More often, you get, in Poland, you get killed. In Holland, you usually get deported to the concentration camp, too. So the consequences were real. People knew it. They don't even want to go near it. Of the people who will get involved in this war in the Netherlands, among the Dutch, the few percentage of people, less than 2% overall, are going to have an active role in this war, there's actually going to be more getting involved to help the Nazis than there will be to resist them in any way. Of all the resistance groups that the Netherlands will end up getting, and about a half dozen will get formed over time, and one of their problems was they were never united with each other. None of them had the firepower to match the Germans. So a lot of them got to go into hiding if they're not getting caught. Of all the resistance groups, the one over time that will become the most effective was known by its initials LO. Landelijke Organisatie in Dutch, English translation, the National Organization, for helping people in hiding. During the course of the war, the LO will help hide and give refuge from the Nazi authorities 300,000 people. They'll be quite effective. But it's not till about mid-1943 that they've got a network going to really keep this operation running well. Interesting as a side note, very unusual this time period. They, one of the founders and leaders was a woman, who, by the way, she'll eventually get caught and die before the war's out. So it was too late for many of the Jews by the time they got going. The LO will have helpers to it. Franz and Mien Weinacher will eventually become helpers to it. But in fact, of those who will actually get involved, whether you're part of the core or the helpers, out of that 300,000, about 30,000 Jews will get into hiding. But they're the number one target. And here's a great way to make extra money. Report something suspicious to the authorities. And sure enough, they go there and they find out there was a Jew in hiding. You who reported it, you get a bonus. Great way to make extra money in these hard times. 
So you're going to end up over that 30,000 or so that will get into hiding, over a third of them get caught. So you're going to have far more non-Jews helping non-Jews non hide if they get involved at all. Helping a Jew hide is almost like touching poison. No thanks. This couple was different. And I'm going to talk to you about them. Before I do, I'm going to go back to the title of this book, To Among the Righteous Few, A Story of Courage in the Holocaust. When this book was being put together by my publisher a couple years ago, the person whose job was to design the book cover called me. She said, I want to understand the significance of this title so I can design the cover accordingly. And she did a good job of capturing the mood of this story. So I said, if you look at the different words in the title, the key word, most of all, is the word righteous. And it comes from a place called Yad Vashem, which you visited last year. Isabel, can you tell everybody what Yad Vashem is? Very good, very good. Education, Research, Remembrance Museum in Jerusalem, Israel. The first of its kind in the world when it was started, 1953. Long time before this subject ever became talked about. Hundreds around the world today, so not an unusual thing. Well, this museum, which has greatly expanded over the years, I've been there twice myself, about 18 years apart, and wow, much bigger the second time, very educational, as you found, very moving. There's a section within the museums, which is where this key word comes from, called the righteous among the nations. And in the grounds, I don't know if you did when you visited there last year, but I always tell people, if you, we talked in advance, they say, go out in the grounds, because in most museums you wouldn't think to do that. Well, what's in the grounds? And they refer to it as the Avenue of the Righteous. You're going to see plaques and trees planted for these people who've gotten this very heroic honor of righteous among the nations. Who were such people? These were non-Jews who, during the course of the Holocaust, risked their lives to try to help save the lives of Jews. Not that many, by the way. One of the ones that most people are aware of, thanks to the movies, 1993 Academy Award winning movie, Schindler's List, in honor of Oscar Schindler. He is righteous among the nations, one of the first to receive this honor. Franz and Mean Weinacher are two Oscar Schindlers. They too received this honor for their heroic efforts. When it comes for them, much later in life as it was for most people here, it's late 1983 when the official honor comes. Unfortunately at that time, Mean, the wife, has already passed away. She died in 1980, so never knew about this. Franz, the husband, was still alive to receive the honor. He lives to 1994, almost the age of 86. So I'm going to tell you about who they were and what they end up doing that earns this heroic honor later on. Well, when the war broke out, they're just a young married couple, and they live in southeastern Netherlands in a little town called Deden. Good luck if you can find it on the map. And most in their area is just little towns and villages, unlike the rest of the country that's very urbanized. And this is what life was like for them, typical of people in this area. Three things. One, raise a family. By the end of 1942, they already had four small children under the age of five. Parents in the room, that'll make you cringe, won't it? Yes. Yeah. And then you have the tough conditions of the war on top of it. Also, what was important to them? The traditional roles of the time period, but under the theme of work hard. So, Ming, you run the household, and she did. Franz, you support your family. He was a semi-skilled laborer. He worked at a grain mill one town over. They were not well off. Nobody in the area was, but he made enough to put food on the table. They were okay. And the last thing that was important for them in this area, be good Catholics. In other parts of the country, be good Protestants. In those days in Western Europe, very different for the most part today, the local clergy leader, and all men, was a man of great authority. And what he said, you do, you do. And what he said, you don't do, don't do, and be at church every Sunday. So that's their lives, ordinary people. No different than anybody else in this area. Well, after the war breaks out, Franz will take a leave of absence from his job at the mill, and he starts a little business where he thinks he can make a little bit more money by taking meat and eggs that he gets in the countryside from farmers. And he travels on the train two hours to the west to Amsterdam, two hours to the west to The Hague. And he's selling this food, which is very scarce during this time period. The Germans have taken most of it and shipped it away for their own needs. And he's starting to sell it to people in the cities who are willing to pay for this thing. So it's basically black market work that he's doing. Don't get caught. Spring 1943. Franz is on one of these business trips in Amsterdam, and he calls upon this doctor acquaintance he's done business with before. And before he leaves the meeting with the doctor, the doctor turns to him and says, would you be willing to help? And the doctor explains, you see, we have this young girl hiding here in the city, and we'd love to get her out to the countryside where you live. What's that town again? Deden. Yes, love to get her out to Deden. And maybe you take her for three weeks so she could get a little better fresh air and a little better food. Oh, and by the way, she's Jewish. So would you be willing to help? And this was Franz's response. OK. Not exactly knowing what he's getting into, but he's a helpful guy. You ask for his help? Sure. Well, before that night is out, he's going to meet this young girl. 
She's 14. And he only knows her by her false Dutch identity name, Freitje. And they will travel out on the train, you only go at night, and finally get home to Deden around midnight. By the way, there's no cell phones in those days. Me and his wife has no idea because he's not home by dinner time like normal. You can imagine what she was doing right now. She ain't going to sleep tonight. Did he get caught? Is he arrested? Am I going to see my husband again? And then about midnight, here he is, shows up with this stranger, this young girl, and Franz briefly explains to me, oh, we're going to have this young girl stay with us here for about three weeks. And this was Mean's response. Well, it's late. Let's get her to bed. Whew, he got lucky there. Well, a new business has just begun for Franz and Mean. In fact, within a week after Freitje had already been there, Mean had been talking with her, and she comes to Franz one day and says, I've been visiting with Freitje. Did you know, Franz, that she's Jewish? Yeah, yeah, I knew. Well, she's got a younger brother still hiding in Amsterdam. Go get him. And then Franz will go in the city and sneak him out, and now there'll be two Jewish children refugees in their home with their four little children. And before long, through various acquaintances, two older women come out with a girl of 17 who happens to be Jewish, and ask Franz and Mean, would you take her into your home? Sure. Now there's three Jewish children, part of their family. The business is picking up. Have they fully understood what they've gotten into? Not yet, but they're proceeding. And then comes the pivotal moment. One day a stranger shows up on Franz's doorstep and starts talking with him. And he won't say what his real name is. He only goes by this code name Long John. And he's making Franz very nervous initially because he seems to know that Franz Weinacher has three Jewish children in his home. Is he a spy? Is he with the authorities? Am I going to get arrested? Franz is nervous. And then this Long John person starts to explain. You could be of help to us. Who is this Long John guy? He's with the LO, the resistance group that helps hide people. Likely the doctor acquaintance in Amsterdam was also part of the LO. They've been talking. This Franz Weinacher, countryside, much less German presence. Maybe he's willing to be helpful. And Long John starts to explain to Franz, and Mean has joined the conversation. You could be of help to us. We're trying to get the remaining Jews out of the cities where the presence of the Nazis and the NSBers, the Dutch Nazis, is very great, and we'd love to get her out to the countryside here. Now, obviously, you can't fit them all in your own home. We can give you some money to fund an operation. We'd like to see if you'd be willing to go around and see if you could recruit people you could trust in the small town areas here, and you can give them some money to help pay for the expenses and to take somebody in. But I don't want to kid you, he says. This is going to be risky, and this will be dangerous. But would you be willing to help? And Franz and me look at each other and without hesitation go, okay. Not exactly know what they've gotten into, but they signed up because you asked for their help. And boy, do they go forward. And this becomes their full life. Franz is getting word people come in his way or go get him out of the cities. And he's now acting like a broker, trying to place him within people's homes throughout the local areas. Often not saying, by the way, they're Jewish. But all the ones he was helping, from children through adults, were Jewish. And as this picks up, so do the dangers and challenges. And when I reflect back on the many challenges and dangers Franz will encounter, mean right there with him, I'm stunned that they actually persisted. Most people would have quit and said, no, thank you. I got four little children to worry about anyway. But they won't quit. And among the many challenges, I'm going to just highlight two briefly. One, the term you would hear is betrayed, meaning Franz had placed an individual in somebody else's home. And sooner or later, they figured out that person's Jewish. And then something happens one day. And those people are calling for Franz, you've got to get here. This person we have has been exposed, Franz. The authorities are going to hear about it. That means they're going to come not only get this person, they're going to come get us. We've been betrayed. Get them out of here. And Franz cannot convince those people to take that individual any longer. Mad scramble, try to find another place. At the height of this, Franz and Mean have eight to 10 extra residents, Jewish refugees, in their own home, their full capacity. And the last among many challenges I'm going to highlight deals with the first adults that Franz and Mean took into their own home. A young married couple similar in age to them. The husband sneaks out of Amsterdam, arrives in the fall of 1943. His wife got out a short time afterwards, and unbeknownst to the husband, his name was Lou. Franz actually placed her at the home of a friend. They often did not want young married couples together. I'll let you figure out why. Well, after being there for a short time, his wife, Angeline, was betrayed, pushed out, Go find the home of Franz Amin Weinacher. I've never been there myself, but good luck to you. And luckily, through directions, she's able to ring a doorbell about midnight. And there is the home of the Weinachers. Franz opens the door, recognizes her. She's in tears, frightened, takes her in. And now there's an emotional reunion with her husband, Lou. They're back together. And Franz Amin say to them the next day, you can stay here. But his wife, Angeline, has a secret she cannot keep secret any longer. She's pregnant. How do you have a baby under these circumstances? 
near impossible. In fact, one of their options, send her away. Well, when this is finally over, and this is going to go on for nearly two years, Franz, with the support of his wife, Mean, will save the lives of over two dozen Jews from certain death, and nobody will get caught. You can see why they are righteous among the nations. Now, the last thing I'm going to cover before I open up to your questions deals with my own meaningful personal connection to this story. I'm going to read you a little excerpt from the book to give you some insight into that. But let me set up this piece first. As I've been on this unexpected journey now for over two years, sharing this story in many places, I've been fortunate to have a great supporter who's been helping me along the way, and I brought her with me here today. She loves your lunch here as well. My wife, Leah Bars. Here she is. Good, good clapping, good clapping. All right. Well, it turns out Leah and her family are actually immigrants from the Netherlands themselves. They come to the United States when she was in the eighth grade, moved to LA, and after finishing high school, she'll go on to UCLA and graduate from college there, starts a career in teaching down there, and then moves to San Francisco, where she has the bulk of her career in education as a school psychologist. And she raises two daughters along the way who are young adult daughters doing fine in their lives today. Later in life, she picks me up. And as I'm told, we've been now, for over six and a half years, had, had wedded bliss for that long. So I take you to May 2009. And this point in her life, it's been 25 years since she was last back to her original homeland of the Netherlands. Nobody left that she knows anymore in terms of family or friends. But there's always been a burning desire to go back and visit parts of the country she never got to see as a kid, and I've never been. So she's been talking to me about a while, and we plan a trip, and we go in May of 2009 for six weeks. And we're having a great time, and along the way, we stumbled into something by accident that I thought was so significant, I end up writing a letter to her two daughters, Shoshana and Alana. That's the piece I'm going to read to you now. And the last thing before I do, if you knew her as a child in the Netherlands, less would you know her by her name Leah, and more by her Dutch nickname Inika. So please keep that in mind. Chapter one, historic moment. Dear Shoshana and Alana, today is Tuesday, May 26, 2009. I'm writing to share more than just travel stories from a wonderful journey your mom and I are having. I want to document something to you that I hope you will find of much value for your own family history. Well, I know some of the history, and you probably do too, coming in contact with the reality of it merges mind and heart into something of great significance. I will explain shortly. Being in the Netherlands, much more than in the United States, one is reminded of World War II and the Holocaust as well. When we started our trip in Amsterdam, we visited the Anne Frank House. It is a wonderful educational museum. Last Friday, we visited the museum and site of Camp Vesterbork. Before World War II, there were 140,000 Jews who lived in the Netherlands. 107,000, that's over 75%, perished during the Holocaust. Vesterbork was the deportation center the Nazis used to ship the Dutch Jews off to the death camps in Poland. We arrived last evening in the city of Eindhoven in the south of the country. Of the places your mom's family lived prior to immigrating to the US, Eindhoven was where they were the longest. Before arriving there yesterday, we stopped in an old town named Robinstein. It is the big small town in an area of villages in a southern section of the country. It is also near where your grandparents were hidden during the war. As we stop and walk around the charming 1600s historic downtown of Robinstein, all two blocks of it, we spot a tourist information office. We go in and your mom asks the staff members about the location of an old church in the nearby small town of Deden and the home that once belonged to a Franz Weinacher is still next to it. For the older folks of this area, which the three office people on hand were, the name of Franz Weinacher is a notable one. They tell your mom not only how to get to the church, but also that one of the Weinacher sons still lives in this particular house. So off we go down the road to Deden. About 10 minutes later, we find the church in question. We park our car there and walk over to the house next door to it. As we walk up the driveway, we see a few people sitting at a table in the front yard on this warm day, and we see the word shalom written on the front side of the house, probably a foot in size. Your mom boldly walks up to the gentleman sitting there and says in Dutch, hello, I'm in a kabars. A roar goes up along with a warm handshake. This man and his wife sitting with him know who Ina Kabars is and much more the significance related to her. In the next few minutes, the Dutch starts flying and phone calls start happening. Within 10 minutes, his youngest sibling, Irene, drives over and joins in the lively discussion which, by the way, is all in Dutch, so I can only watch. <laughs> the man who has greeted us is Franz Weinacher, Jr. He is the youngest son of the aforementioned Franz Weinacher. 
his father Franz, with the support of his mother Mean, saved your grandparents and your mom, baby Inika, during World War II. They all survived the Holocaust because this Catholic man and his wife hid them and other Jews and helped even more hide from the Nazis. Do you recognize the significance of this moment? Franz the son and his wife also named Irene visited Israel themselves last year. They showed us a blown up picture of the memorial plaque and tree planted in Yad Vashem's Av of the Righteous section in honor of their parents, which was when the historic significance of what I was witnessing really hit me. After visiting for over an hour, they've invited us to come back Wednesday evening. They have three other siblings who are all alive and live in the local area. So your mom will likely meet more of the Weinacher family who she last saw 25 years ago. I always love the oohs and ahs. Now I'll open up the floor. We've got a few minutes. We can take a few questions. Well, let me start with it. And that you are... Jean? I'll let you start with that one. <laughs> what happened when you came back um, from that visit with the family that Wednesday? Yeah, going back for the visit with the family that Wednesday, yes. Good question, Jean. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> There's five Weinacher siblings, five children, four during the war and one gets born right after. And if you think about if our own lives here today in the Bay Area, this is how unusual and special these people are. And if one of your brothers and sisters called you and said, by the way, this person who we knew who we haven't seen in 25 years just showed up unexpectedly. Could you come over tomorrow night and visit? Here's the answer a lot of people would say here in the Bay Area today. Oh, I wish I could. <laughs> but I got this obligation going and this going with the kids or this going with the family and this with the job and send them my regards. When they heard that in the Kabars, who they've not seen in 25 years, was in town, all five came. They weren't going to miss this opportunity. One of the pictures we have in the book is a reunion, which becomes a trigger point that eventually uh, will lead to this story. But it, through the family, there's one of the things that helped in this. And so they were very happy to see her. And we've been back, by the way, a couple times since to the Netherlands and have visited with the Beinockers and always been very welcomed. So we've been very neat. And you want, me, you want to answer or you want me to answer? You want me to answer. All right. And I'll often will add in there is uh, I mentioned it had been 25 years since she was last back in the Netherlands. When she was there, it was the summer of 84. Her parents, who were still alive then and in touch with Franz, had heard that he had gotten the recognition of righteous among the nations. Well, the local towns now said, oh my goodness, we got a hero in our midst. We should do something to honor him. And in that summer of 84, they put on a parade and festivities to honor their local hero, Franz Weinacher, who flew over from San Francisco with her then five-year-old daughter to be part of the festivities and in the parade in a cabars. And then you lose touch, of course, and life goes on, raising a family. So it's been a very happy reunion, one of the blessings that have come out of this. So thank you for your question. Wow. Well, I, I assume, was, was Inika the baby that was born in their home? And then secondly, you said they'd live right next door to the church, and the priest had executive authority of the mm -hmm. Did the priest know what was going on next door? All right, we'll save your first question towards the end. But uh, the priest, this particular church happened to be a vacant Protestant church. And actually, the home they had was, used to be part of the parsonage of it. So it was being rented to them. But to your point about the priest in the area, the local parish priest, Father Johannes Simons. Well, I'll put it in the, we'll play Jeopardy with this. So here's the answer, and you tell me the question. Name one of the biggest thorns to Franz Weinacher and his special work here in this whole area. And the question was, who was the priest? Yes, yes. Father Johannes Simons eventually through, because he has to know everything going on, eventually through different gossip, picks up there's something going on, and Franz won't deny it. But he'll become a constant thorn and pressure for him in this whole effort that makes it very challenging. The good news about Father Simons, luckily the Germans never captured him and interrogated him, because he would have given them up. He would have sang like a canary. And a little, I always like to add this little epilogue here. Neat thing, uh, in our visit, we come back to the Netherlands after this accidental visit two years later, and we visit with the Weinachers, and Nellie, the oldest, who's been our point person for the family. She's 75, going on 50, wonderful, energetic lady. And one day she gives us her car. She says, go ahead, you want to drive around the local area, see some of the towns that Franz had his experiences in? And by the way, where are, you, where are your parents buried? Oh, they're in the town of Damon, just one over from Deaton, in a little Catholic cemetery there, and here's how you get there. Great, we're going to go pay our respects. And there's the nice gravestones of Franz and mean Weinacher. One row over, Father Johannes Simons. 
even in death, they couldn't get away from this thorn. <laughs> Thank you for your questions. Good questions. We'll take a couple more here before we begin. Yes. I just want to say I think it's wonderful that you're doing this. Thank you. Because you mentioned that in Europe you see physical reminders of the war that we live yeah. in. Yeah. And we don't have that no. actually in this country. So we have a human being who's not very old. That's right. As a reminder of it. Because one of the things that I see with, with our students in the United States is the ones who aren't interested in history, the memories of <coughs> the war. Thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah, for them it's ancient history. Mm -hmm. And uh, Inica is not ancient. She's alive. That's right. That's right. Well, they can talk to me afterwards because I'd love to come to your class even to maybe do something with students there. We've done in different schools things with this. But, you know, it was interesting too because one of my first impressions, because that struck me right away, and it was my first time to the Netherlands. And when we arrived in May of 2009, we were actually about three days past a major holiday there they call Remembrance Day. It's equivalent in name in our country. It's called Memorial Day. And I only say equivalent in name because Memorial Day, what's that? Picnic day off. We're not remembering anything, but thanks for the day off. In that country, those scars run through the generations. The Netherlands suffered greatly in that war. And, and, and you'd have thought we didn't miss the holiday, you'd think. Because here we go into one of the major squares in Amsterdam. And what's there three days after the official holiday? And there's still flowers and little makeshift plaques and a lot of people hanging around and just kind of looks like meditating, praying. Because most everybody knows somebody of different generations that suffered in the Netherlands during this war. So that's what made the country, and you saw it throughout the country, different things that I thought very significant. It wasn't fought on our soil. Yeah, good, good question, good comment, thank you. We'll take one or two more here. Yes, wonder, Isabel, and then I'll go over there. I wonder did Leah live in Spain? Ah. Uh, well, we'll do that shortly. Uh, <laughs> uh, about a year, year and a half, okay. when liberation finally comes and they can move on. Yeah, so and some of you know the answer to my last question, but you had a question, then I'll go to Wendy. Go ahead. I was just wondering in your first three questions, mm -hmm. your own um, observation of why did these people uh, do those things? Why did they why respond they? in the way they did? Yeah, those three great question, great question. What is your name? Cynthia. C Cynthia, thank you very much. Great question. You know, why do they get involved when most don't? Yeah. When there's this climate of hate and indifference going on, why will they do it? And so I'm going to answer you in two ways. First answer, I don't know. You know, I never got to speak to Franz directly. You know, I got to speak to Nellie as the point person for the family, and nobody could answer that question directly, and he was never asked, and the information we got from him never spoke to the whys, it's just what he did. But I think I can answer it. Through my own research, not just with the family here, but my own research of studying people who've been righteous among the nations, there's been some common qualities that researchers have seen out of many of them, that when I look at those qualities, they fit. For example, here's a few. The ability to care beyond themselves. And if I could sprinkle that on people here in 2013, I'd be sprinkling all over the place. I'd love that. But it's very easy just to be concerned about oneself. They had that caring quality about them. The ability to be calm under pressure and even be bold in certain situations. They get tested and challenged. Very dangerous things happen, and yet they just seem to be unflappable. They fit that very much. And we even learn later on, among other qualities, and empathy, of course, being one of the big qualities, they could understand often better than the people who are suffering the fate about the dangers of that, they understood sometimes better than those own people, especially the Jews they were helping. They could understand, which again, another wonderful quality I wish I could sprinkle on people, among others that they shared in. And when you look at that, and Nellie did share something with us later on in our last visit more, that's not an exact answer, but it gives you a sense. She said somewhere, later, years later, I was talking with my father about this one day, and he said there was a point in time in his life he was reflecting, he said, I wanted to make a difference at least once in my life. Boy, did he. So I think you look at those things, you can see why that they thought it was the right thing to do. They had that ethical, moral character that said, this is the right thing to do. You don't turn a blind eye. Great question. No wonder you had. I just wonder, were there close calls? Yes. Yeah. Definitely. Definitely. I'll let you read more about it. But yes, they were definitely close calls. Luckily, they don't get caught and taken away. But they had close. And, a lot of, you're, and they're dealing. You Think about this. They're living on the edge for about two years with this. Because the, the Nazis didn't give warnings or tickets. You know, don't do that again. You know, the consequences were real. And they had false raids. You just had to be prepared constantly. And so they're living on that edge constantly, and yet they didn't turn away. Yes? Was the, was the boat to go to Germany um, to participate in one of the war camps? Yes. Ah, one of those things. I'll let you read more about it. But uh, I'll just give you the little insight. He seemed to come up with an illness. <laughs> so that illness, obviously fabricated, helped work through that, among other things. 
But and he's going to have a lot of other challenges like that to come up. That luckily he does get some support from other people to make a difference here. So we'll do our oh one more question, and then we'll do our. Anita and her parents moved here right after the war. Uh, not right away. It's about uh, 13 years later mm -hmm. that then they her father wanted to thought life would be better somewhere else in the United States. Did they stay in that town? Uh, well, they'll end up they they leave this area. They go back to Amsterdam initially, where most of their family's gone now. Nothing much to go back to. And eventually her dad gets a job. He's an architect at Phillips, which is headquartered in Eindhoven. And that's where they spend Eindhoven, which is in the south, a major city in the south. And that's where they spend. I think a lot of people, oh, all right, one more. Go ahead, Wendy. Um, your book is written for what age group? And how people can read Well, so here's who's read it that we've heard of. As young as, say, 11 years old and those over 90 and in between. And, so, and, and we hear the comments are very similar. They enjoyed the story. It's, they learned something. It's inspirational. So that's been the neat thing about it. And it was purposely written that way that it doesn't matter your age. You'll learn something, but I've got a good story to tell with it. Thank you for the question. So here's the last question we always like to end. And I think this audience could be at least half of them know the answer to this question. Bob was hinting at it before, but we'll let him. We'll come back to Bob's question. We'll have him ask it this way. <laughs> so whatever happened with that baby? Uh-huh. <laughs> You know, the last challenge I mentioned, you know, the pregnant woman there, the young married woman there. All right, uh, so we want, let's, at least this half of the room, I think, knew. We'll, we'll go to the back row. <laughs> Got an idea? You know, oh, you know the answer already. I could hear in your last question. Any, anyone uh, not certain? It's okay if you're not. All right, let's go with, who's certain? Are oh, you not certain? I'm not certain. Thank you, thank you. But I think, I think it's this lady that came over here. Oh, oh, oh this lady, not, not over here. Okay, all right. <laughs> The lady in red, that's right. Yeah, yeah. John Dillinger had a problem with that. Yeah. Uh, here's the short answer, chapter nine. <laughs> but uh, what is your name? Marie. Marie, thank you, Marie. Yes, I brought the baby with me here today. Yep. Yeah, yeah. When I say I have a very meaningful personal connection to this story, it doesn't get any more meaningful than personal than this. Yeah, yeah, thank you, thank you. I'll give you just a little insight, and I'm not going to give it all away here. But uh, as you can imagine, this was a huge dilemma for Franz and Mean when they find out her parents, Lou and Angeline Bars, there she is pregnant. It's not a normal situation. They can't go, for example, to the local hospital and have the birth done there. Because obviously, that gets reported, the authorities are going to find out. Her mother would be sent to a concentration camp and this baby would never be born. And of course, the other common option of those days for just normal circumstances in small town areas, a lot of the births were done in the home. Midwife, doctor comes in. They couldn't do that either. They already had eight to 10 Jewish refugees in the home, so that's dangerous exposure. We can't have that. So they have a huge dilemma if they can do anything about it. And when they turn to their contact with the LO, what do we do here? He said, well, you can send her away, but I'm going to leave it to you to decide. So he left it up to them. Well, Franz and Mean, I'll give you this little insight. Come up with a strategy, although they're not sure how they're going to execute it when they come up with it, but they talk to her parents about it who agree to it. However we get this baby born, we will register her with the authorities as our child, so she could be a baby out with our small children rather than a baby in hiding. I mentioned we've been back to the Weinachers a couple of times since. Well, when we were back in 2011, and this is when you know you had a good visit, uh, Nellie, who we stayed with, who doesn't speak much English, but she turned to me in English as we were leaving, and she says, when are you coming back? <laughs> That's when you know you had a good visit. And in Dutch, she speaks to her and hugs her very tightly with tears in her eyes. And this is the English translation of what she said. Goodbye, my war sister. This is almost like a half-sister to them. And it's a reminder of the miracle their parents performed. And what I always say is thank God for the courage and compassion of Franz and Mean Weinacher. Thank you all. Great audience here. Thank you. <laughs>